Okay, and welcome to the next of the series on systematic reviews. Uh, first series we overlaid uh, common methodology for completing a systematic review. Uh, now we're going to get into a bit more into the nuts and bolts of completing a systematic review. So today we're going to talk about avoiding bias, quality assessment, and also synthesizing results. So how we can create some nice clear messages for both researchers and clinicians from our systematic review and our efforts in terms of searching. So first of all, avoiding a bias within a systematic review is a, is a vital strength of a good quality systematic review. A uh, key thing for a systematic review compared to narrative reviews as we've discussed is that if it's done systematically, we should lead to the same results whether it's done by one group or another group. So the key thing to avoiding bias requires pre-planning, so planning your search strategy, planning quality assessment that you're going to apply, planning what you're going to do in terms of synthesizing the results and defining levels of evidence. So that way it's very clear as to how we've come to the conclusions we've come to. <coughs> the second part is that we should try and incorporate two reviewers. Um, the second reviewer is there to, to essentially double check everything. So if we do this all independently, so both the search, we can make sure no articles are missed. We can both complete the quality assessment scale, make sure we've got similar findings. If we don't, we can come to some sort of consensus. And then also checking the data extraction, so making sure we're pulling the same information out of each paper that we're including in our review. It's also good to have a third reviewer there, because one, two people won't always agree. So if we've got a third reviewer there, they can be there to create the consensus for us. Uh, another really good strong point of a systematic review, if possible, is to try and complete a meta-analysis. So the meta-analysis will uh, make your systematic review so much stronger and make your messages so much clearer. And then finally, the important thing is to try and make sure we set predetermined levels of evidence. So we create a, a system where we've got strong evidence, moderate evidence, weak evidence, limited evidence, no, no evidence, etc. As long as this is clear and well defined at the beginning, what it means is it's much easier to compare different interventions across, uh, across a pathology. So if we've got one intervention that's got strong evidence, another intervention that's got weak evidence, then we're more likely to use the one that's got strong evidence within clinical practice. So how do we compare and contrast our results? Many of our reviews will contain studies which have conflicting results. We read the abstract and one will tell us one thing, another will tell us, tell us a completely different thing. So what we want to do is we want to try and work out whether we can trust the results of each individual study and then the ones that we can trust we can combine together and hopefully we can come up with some sort of clear consensus as to what the findings are for a, for a certain question. So first of all we need to think about assessing the risk of bias. So this is quality assessment so you're probably familiar with uh, things like the Pedro scale um, which can assess quality of randomised controlled trials but there's a number of others which we can also use which we'll go into. And importantly, we also need to consider what other key information we need. So what other things might be affecting results of certain studies. So it might be that one study is looking at the effects of exercise on a certain uh, condition. So exercise, let's say, in knee osteoarthritis. But what could affect the results could be the level of knee osteoarthritis. So that might be an important consideration. We may have one study which says, yes, exercise is effective, and this is in mild to moderate a way. Another study says no, exercise is not effective and this may be a more severe OA, so that might explain why we've got different findings. So you need to think about what is going to affect the findings across the studies that we have. And then importantly from there we want to try and compare the results and see if we can come up with some clear messages, some take home messages for both researchers and for clinicians. And this is where meta-analysis can come in and can help and we'll discuss meta-analysis in a, in a subsequent lecture um, coming up. So firstly, in terms of describing the quality of included studies, it's really important that we, in each review that we complete, that we critique each included study. So use quality assessment scales. They're created for a reason. They're created to, to give guidance and so that's an unbiased critique of the study. Um, and then also think about with your discussion when you're writing up your systematic review, make sure you discuss individual aspects which are important to the validity or individual study. So these are things like I talked about where it might be grading of osteoarthritis which may not be included in some of the quality assessment scales. It may be that uh, BMI has an impact on findings. For example, we know that there's some systemic issues in terms of rehabilitation and tendinopathy so we might need to consider that BMI might be different between groups and that might affect our outcomes. So there's lots of different things that we can use. Create tables, which we'll go through an, a nice simple example table shortly, but create tables of all of your key points. So not only the quality assessment scale outcomes, 
but also these individual aspects that may be important. So possibly co-interventions that may be included, um, age, gender, height, weight, BMI, etc. Um, also thinking about gradings of different conditions. So anything that might be relevant to your study, if you can tabulate it, it makes it far easier to compare multiple different studies. In terms of discussing the quality of your studies, trying to synthesise this into your discussion can sometimes be quite difficult and often it's easier to form a separate section after discussion of, of your results or possibly before discussion of your results. It, in essence, where you put this is up, open to interpretation, but in my eyes you probably want to discuss your limitations up front if there's a lot of limitations because that way the reader will interpret your discussion in light of these limitations of the previous research. If there's less limitations and your findings are, are more valid or the findings are, are much stronger and clearer clinical messages, then perhaps you put the discussion of limitations towards the end. Then importantly, it's, it's no good just critiquing studies and saying they did this bad, they did this wrong. We need to also provide some sort of positive spin on it and suggest how improvements could be made. And this is really important for guiding future research and certainly in, in terms of readers, it gives, leaves them some positive messages about what can be done going forward. So some quality assessment scales which we can use for in our included studies. It depends on our study design what we use. So we've got Pedro scale which is probably the most commonly used one within musculoskeletal research for randomised controlled trials. There are a number of other ones out there which are also valid, especially if you look across Cochrane reviews, there's a number of different uh, quality assessment scales. Essentially you want to find the one that fits your research question the best and also critiques your studies the best. A number of other studies, the Pedro scale won't apply, so you might have a lot of non-randomised controlled trials in your study. So you may still have studies looking at interventions for certain health conditions, but these studies might not be randomised. And if we just apply Pedro to them, it doesn't really give us a lot of information. If we break Pedro down, most of it's biased towards high quality randomised controlled trials. So Downs and Black have created their own quality index, and this is a really useful one for evaluating non-randomised controlled trials in terms of interventions. Some of you may be doing systematic reviews based around factors associated with a certain condition or epidemiological type studies and the epidemiological appraisal instrument is quite a useful one for these types of studies. And with both the Downs and Black and the AAI or epidemiological appraisal instrument, you can also modify these based on your review questions and what, what sort of studies you're including. Because some of the, there's quite a lot of criteria in both of these and they won't all apply to the studies included within your systematic review. So what you need to do is go through them systematically and work out which ones are important to your studies and your questions that you're asking and then work out which ones aren't. And if there's no importance to them or they're not relevant to your question and to your studies included in your review, then you may want to omit some of those, uh, some of those items to make make sure it's more efficient in terms of both tables and in terms of write-up, etc. <coughs> There's also a number of subject-specific uh, quality assessment scales, so I've previously created some for patellofemoral pain, uh, but there's a number of others out there and you might want to have a look and see if there's anything specific for the type of review that you're doing and see what you can find. We've all got, there's also some out there for Achilles tendinopathy and there'd be a number of others out in the literature and certainly worthwhile having a look and seeing. So in terms of an example for synthesising your results and trying to think about not just the quality assessment but also some of these key factors that may affect your findings, it's really good to create a table. And here's an example of a table. These are mock articles and these are looking at the effectiveness of exercise in knee osteoarthritis. So you'll see here, if we, if we just focus on the results for the, for the time being, you'll see here across the eight studies that are there, we've got a significant increase in gait speed. We've got no difference in a, a knee functional questionnaire. We've got improvements in a knee functional questionnaire. We've got no difference in a knee functional questionnaire. We've got actually the control groups get, gets better. We've got improvements in knee function questionnaire. We've got no difference in a walk test. And then we've got improvements again in a knee functional questionnaire. So if we ignore all the methodological aspects of the studies within this, then we really are quite confused about what we can what we can consider to be relevant findings and what sort of messages we can portray. So what you need to do is have a think about well, what are the things that might, might affect your, your study results within your systematic review. So as we mentioned before, diagnosis, so it might be the severity of knee osteoarthritis, so we've got a range of different severities here. It might be the design of the trial, so perhaps randomised controlled trials versus non-randomised trials may make, have an impact. 
It might be the type of exercise that's being applied or co-interventions that are being provided with the exercise and that may affect our findings. It could be gender related, so we might, might expect different results between male and females or it might be age related that might affect some of our results. It could be matching of uh, participant characteristics at baseline. The other important consideration is if we've got a, a non-significant finding that may be related to sample size, so this is also important. So there's a number of different things that you need to consider across your systematic review in terms of what is provided from your studies in order to decide what conclusions you can draw around your systematic review. So what I'd encourage you to do is with your own research and with your own systematic review that you're doing is to collate all of your studies into a very similar table to this and see what factors are, are I guess, linked to some of the findings and it'll help you to synthesise and write your discussion. Importantly, it can also help you determine how you might pull some of your data and we'll discuss this a little bit more later when we get to meta-analysis, but you might be able to pull some of the data together for different levels of neoosteoarthritis. So you might be interested in dividing into those with severe versus those with mild. Um, you might be interested in pulling data where NSAIDs are provided in conjunction with exercise, such as this study here, and you might separate that from where you've just got a simple exercise program. Um, it might be time points that you're looking at. You can look at a number of different things to divide things. You might divide it into male and female. And from this, you might find that you've got different findings depending on what subgrouping you do. So you might find that if we look at exercise for, for males only, there may be different findings to females only. Have a play with this table and see if you can find any common themes um, through this and see what clusters you can create in terms of findings and what conclusions you can make. So the other thing to consider is predetermined levels of evidence. So the most commonly used is Van Tulder criteria, um, and this can be modified depending on what your, your review is uh, encompassing. And, and with the Van Tulder, in essence, it's rates level of evidence from strong, moderate, limited, conflicting, or no evidence. And you'll see strong evidence based on the original criteria is consistent findings among multiple high quality randomized controlled trials. Moderate would be consistent findings against lower quality randomized controlled trials or controlled clinical trials or one high quality randomized controlled trial. Limited would be based on just one low quality RCT or a case control study. Conflicting makes sense, there'd be inconsistent findings among multiple trials and no evidence would mean that there's, there's no trials. So the key thing is to come up with your criteria at the beginning so that way there's no bias in terms of what you are putting into your conclusions with your systematic review. So go away, have a think about how this all applies to your systematic review question, um, and then think about some key points that may be associated with your systematic review, some things that you need to consider in regards to what will affect findings, and then have a think also about what kind of quality assessment scale you might be using to, for your systematic review. Then from there, you should be able to start to create some really nice tables and some, some really nice tools to facilitate both synthesis of your findings but then also facilitate the discussion. So thank you for your time on, on this lecture related to